Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Kansas City Public Library. I hope you are all aware that uh, Missouri has a concealed axe law. <laughs> and we hope those of you who have them keep them concealed. I do want to mention a couple of uh, upcoming programs. Uh, uh, on uh, Sunday, February 1st, you know what that is, don't you? Groundhog Day. So we have the, uh, the, 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 okay, it's the second. We're doing our program on the first. I'm sorry. Uh, in, in honor of Groundhog Day on the second, on the first, we'll, we'll have Ken Armitage, uh, the world's leading expert on marmots, uh, uh, talking about marmots on, on, on his mind. Um, and uh, that, 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 that should be uh, an, an interesting uh, program. You can really dig it. Um, thank you. Uh, on February 4th, Wednesday, February 4th, we're continuing an, our ongoing series, uh, uh, Kansas City Cradle of Entrepreneurs, looking at great entrepreneurs, talking to great entrepreneurs uh, in our community. And we have one of the most interesting, uh, not as well known as some that we've done, like John McDonald of Boulevard uh, Brewing or uh, Danny O'Neill of Roastery, uh, but, but equally wonderful uh, in what he's done uh, out in the world. And that's Bill Zayner of A. Zayner and Company. Many of you will know the buildings of Frank. Frank Geary, the Bilbao Museum, and the you know the swooping metal roofs uh, that uh, that Frank Geary's done, uh, all that metal work, the Chicago Public Library, the uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Disney World uh, 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 retreats, uh, etc., are done right here in Kansas City, a few blocks from here, actually, about ten blocks to the east, by the A. Zayner Company, by Bill Zayner. Uh, he's he's probably the greatest. Uh, commercial building, artful, aesthetic building, uh, metal worker in the world. Um, and uh, so he'll tell you all about that in a conversation with me on, uh, on next Wednesday. Um, and then I, I want to mention an uh, ongoing uh, uh, program that we do with uh, the University of Missouri at Kansas City History Department. They have their annual McKinsey Lecture, which presents one of the great American historians uh, uh, every year. Uh, this year we have Lori Glover from St. Louis University, who will be talking about her book, Founders as Fathers, The Private Lives and Politics of the American Revolutionaries. Uh, which has, has had great reviews. And uh, last but not least, uh, or maybe least, I don't know, you have to decide, uh, uh, I'll mention uh, Meet the Past is back uh, at the end of the month on Wednesday, February 25th. Uh, I will be interviewing uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, the author of uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God uh, and uh, uh, many, many other uh, uh, great, great books. Um, and uh, so that's, that's pretty exciting. At least for me, I don't know about you. Um, so um, let me start by saying the prayer <clears throat> that was said by many uh, during the period of time that Anders Winroth is writing about. Save us, Lord, from the wild Northmen who lay waste our country. They strangle the crowd of old men and of youth and of virgin boys. Repel from us all evil. There is this image of the Vikings, uh, as, as Professor Winross says in, in, in his book, that like the Mongols, they cultivated the image of ferocity. And so the question is, how true is that? Well, I, I decided to go to the uh, unimpeachable source, uh, History Channel. Um, <laughs> And uh, you know, so the, so my age, you may have seen the you know the Richard Widmark movie, uh, which may have been your image of the Vikings. Um, but I went to the History Channel to see their their new, relatively new. It's, I think it's in its third season now, The Vikings, which is a, I think a highly <clears throat> fictionalized account of the Vikings. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, but this this image of conquest and pillage uh, must be true because they have beanie hats for sale in the store, the online store, one that says conquest and one that says pillage. <laughs> And, and, and there's a trucker cap that says, I like this one, it says, see you in Valhalla. <laughs> and it, which also reminded me, I, th there is personal influence in my life of the, of the, of the Vikings. Uh, my great-great-grandfather, who uh, created, invented uh, uh, Roman meal bread, uh, ended up in, so there's some Roman influence there too, you know, classical influence, uh, 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 in Toronto, uh, in, a, in a house uh, that was in a little valley in, in, uh, in Toronto, which is now the headquarters, by the way, of the Toronto Zoo, the headquarters building of the Toronto Zoo, and he called it, 
his house, Valley Hollow. So anyway, I thought. Um, well, so were they, were, they, were they as brutal that you'll find out from and Andrews uh, uh, Winroth, there, there is a, he makes a, a wonderful comparison, which I won't tell you the details, between Charlemagne uh, and, uh, uh, and, and the Vikings, uh, which I hope he'll, he will tell you about. But the, the influence uh, of, the, of the Vikings is, is actually fairly tremendous when you, when you think about it. Um, I discovered uh, in the book uh, on page 58 uh, that you can speak there's a long paragraph on page 58. You have to buy the book. You have to buy the book. On page 58, uh, that's entirely in Norse, but which everyone in this room will actually understand. Um, yeah, it's really extraordinary the influence of the Vikings, of the, of the Norsemen, uh, on our language, of course. But there are, even, there, there are other things. So there, there was a, a great uh, king, a great Norse king, a great Viking king named Harold Bluetooth. <laughs> It's actually where Bluetooth comes from, believe it or not. It actually is true. That's where Bluetooth comes from. And of course, King Canute standing in, uh, uh, in front of the waves, which is probably not true, though I don't believe Professor Winroth goes into that in the, uh, in the book. But, but the trade routes, not just the, the conquest, and not just sailing up the, the Seine or uh, uh, going to, uh, to, to England, to North Umbria in and, and, and conquest, but also the trade, uh, the trade around the world. They not only went, as we know, to, uh, to Greenland and Newfoundland, uh, they, they, they were trading with the caliphs in the Middle East, uh, tra trading with the, with the Russians, becoming Russians, uh, becoming Russian uh, kings themselves yeah, at one point or another. They're in many ways the origins of the modern states uh, in, in Scandinavia, of Norway, Sweden, uh, and Denmark. Um, uh, and also in, in our own, uh, our own, uh, the United States, the, the history of, uh, of uh, uh, our laws, uh, the, the, the history of our language, uh, when you think about the Danegeld uh, in, uh, in, in the north of, of England, the, the laws uh, of property and taxation uh, th uh, that, uh, that they created there, the Danegeld is really the ancestor of our modern property taxes, indeed of tax increment financing in Kansas City. As a small ongoing joke that I have, sorry, sorry, um, and and then and then if you really uh, and, and as he comes to the end of uh, of his book, he, he talks about that that moment in uh, in our history and in, in in the history of, of Europe and the history of uh, of uh, uh, the English speaking peoples, which which is maybe the most important uh, one of the most important moments in our history. There are two battles in 1066. We, we we usually know about the Battle of Hastings. Most people know about the Battle of Hastings, where William the Conqueror defeats King Harold, uh, uh, the Anglo-Saxon king. Uh, but there was o only uh, only weeks, months, a couple of months before there there was the Battle of Stamford Bridge, where Harold defeated uh, Harold Hargrada, the the uh, the Norse uh, uh, king, who uh, uh, who had come to uh, to conquer with with Harold of England's brother, it should be said as well, and defeated him. And and uh, the, William the Conqueror's conquest of England probably wouldn't have happened without the. Uh, uh, this hard battle that uh, that uh, Harold uh, uh, of England had had fought uh, before, uh, only a couple of months before, and of course it's also true that that uh, that William the Conqueror was himself the Norman king, uh, the king of Nor Normandy, which of course comes from the Norse, which comes ultimately from the from the Vikings, and so um, uh, it, it 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 has a huge influence. This hi history of the Vikings, the history of the Norsemen, has a huge influence on us. Anders Winroth himself is an extraordinary uh, scholar. Uh, he's a MacArthur uh, Fellow, a genius. He received the Genius uh, Genius Award uh, for a, a, an extraordinary uh, piece of uh, what what is called. Uh, let, let me quote. A remarkable piece of hard-headed academic uh, detective work, Richard Broadhead, who is now the president of Duke, uh, referred, re referred to it as, uh, or John Butler, who was then chair of the history department at Yale, a simply stunning, uh, uh, he called him a simply stunning scholar and a wonderful, warm, humane person, uh, which means, of course, he can't actually have Viking blood uh, if he's one. Uh, <laughs> Um, but which you know he can talk to you talk to you about. Um, uh, he's uh, uh, the author of a number of books on uh, medieval uh, history, uh, the making of uh, Gratian's Decretum, which is that that great piece of of, 
uh, scholarship and detective work where he completely reversed uh, the, uh, uh, the, the history, uh, the, the, the timeline on uh, uh, canon law, church law uh, in the Middle Ages. The conversion of Scandinavia, Vikings, merchants, and missionaries in the remaking uh, of Northern Europe. Uh, and, uh, and and many other uh, books and articles, uh, many awards that he's won. Um, it, it's an honor for us to have Professor Winroth here. Thank you very much for your very kind uh, introduction. Don't believe everything he says. I'm very happy to be here. It's the first time in my life in Kansas City. It's not the first time in my life in, in Missouri. Uh, I've never been to Kansas in my life, but they promised that they will drive me there in the, after the lecture, <laughs> if I do well. So now, please help me. Uh, what a glorious building this is. What a glorious institution. It's so, it's so wonderful to see. To see a library do so well and have such imaginative ways of organizing itself, laying itself out and of, of having events of all kinds of things. I almost want to change my ticket so I can listen to those marmots <laughs> on Sunday. I have one at home under the gardening shed. But I like libraries. I sort of more or less grew up in the city library in my hometown in Sweden. My parents did not have a lot of books, but there were books in the library. And that's where I started to read about all the strange things that I've become interested in over my life, including the Vikings. As the director said, I don't think I descend from any Vikings. Because since I'm Swedish, I'm most likely to descend from the people who stayed at home and sat on their hands <laughs> instead of going out and doing exciting things in Europe. So, no uh, concealed battle axes. <laughs> Vikings. We all know our Vikings. <laughs> or at least they are difficult to avoid. They seem to appear everywhere in popular culture, like in movies, TV shows, the, what, each more outlandish than the last. Anybody see this? I still have not managed to find a person who actually saw this. <laughs> it looks... well, I don't know. Oh. We like to dress up like Vikings. <laughs> in different ways. <laughs> Viking trademarks encourage us to buy everything from sardines to barbecues <laughs> to river cruises. <laughs> so we pretty much think we know the Vikings and we think that we like them, right? But do we really know them? I would like to present to you today uh, six things that you might not have known about Vikings. I don't dare to say that you don't know about Vikings because who am I to come here and tell you what you know or do not know. So apologies for, for everybody who already knows everything what I, what I am going to say. The library director obviously knew, obviously is going to know all of it. He's, he's clearly read my books, which I was happy to see. <laughs> First, we think of the Vikings as dirty and filthy, right? But in fact, the Vikings took great care of their appearance. This is obviously already if we look at how they were buried in their graves. Their graves contain things that they used in life that might come in useful also in the afterlife. Uh, we find, of course, the expected assortment of swords and battle axes and those kinds of things. But there are also combs, tweezers, ear spoons. Has anybody used an ear spoon here? <laughs> That's another thing. I have not found a person who actually seen that film. I have not found a person who actually used an ear spoon in their life. The Vikings did. They kept clean. 
The idea that they, were, they kept themselves neat and clean is in fact strengthened if you remember that the Scandinavian word for Saturday means bathing day. <laughs> Apparently they bathed once a week. Medieval persons are otherwise not particularly known for being cleanly. But the Vikings were, and people noticed already in the Viking Age. Even the victims of the Vikings noticed that they were clean. English chronicle, chroniclers complained that the Vikings, with all their bathing and unheard of practice of changing their clothes and washing them, uh, made the Eng Englishmen look bad <laughs> and smell bad. So English women ran away with those neat and tidy Scandinavians. <laughs> I didn't make this up. This is... <laughs> so that was it. It was their cleanliness that made the English women run away with them. Uh, and I'm sorry, sir, there in the back, it wasn't their helmets. <laughs> they had magnificent horned helmets those did not entice the women, because the Vikings did actually not wear magnificent horned helmets. Sorry. Well, if you stop to think about it just for a moment, if you are going to go into battle where people are fighting with axes, with clubs and with swords, you don't want a helmet with big things protruding out, because how easy is it not to just kick the helmet off your head? And then you are dead, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's magnificent, so thank you. <laughs> Nothing like a horned helmet has ever been found by archaeologists. So where does it come from? We know exactly where it comes from. It comes from the world premiere uh, of Richard Wagner's opera cycle, The Ring of the Nibelungen in Bayreuth, Germany in 1876, where the costume designer came up with the brilliant idea of helmets with horns on it. <laughs> the idea quickly became popular and took on a life of its own, and we still live with it, but they didn't wear them. Let's move on. Fact number two. You speak like a Viking every day. All the time. I mean, what do you think of your in-laws? Are they awesome? Well, if you have awesome in-laws, you just there use two Norse words, Scandinavian words, with the Vikings brought to England and the English brought to America. Or what do you think of your husband? Is he thrifty? Again, two Scandinavian words. Do you know of any angry fellows? Or perhaps the even low rotten crooks? <laughs> Have you ever shifted gears? I mean, there was a time when not every car was at automatic. Or simply dosed happily. Or perhaps you want eggs and steak. All those words are Scandinavian words, Norse words, which the Vikings brought to England. Many Scandinavians came to England not only to raid and plunder, but actually to move in, especially in the eastern parts of uh, the country. Uh, and they brought with them their customs and their language, some of which the Eng English gratefully made their own. And we still use it to this day. The third thing we need to know about the Vikings, as uh, the, libra the uh, library director already told us. Harold Bluetooth did not invent Bluetooth technology. This was, we all use Bluetooth, right? There's probably Bluetooth in this thing. No, actually not, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I'm not, my brother is a computer scientist. I do the history in the family, he does the computers. Uh, he knows the people who invented this Bluetooth technology. They were history-savvy Scandinavian computer scientists who picked a name from the Viking Age to use for, uh, as a name for the technology. Have you ever thought about what does the, the logo mean? Yes. Those are his initials in runes. Harold Bluetooth. 
I think this is quite appropriate since King Harold Bluetooth himself, who died in the 980s, was no stranger to writing in runes, uh, the writing system of the Vikings. This is his rune stone. It's been colored with the, uh, in a way that one can guess that it was colored at the time. It's no longer, the, the color has washed on, off since then. But enough of all this fighting and swords and Bluetooth and computers and such. I hope you will like the fourth, fourth thing that I think everybody should know about Vikings. They loved poetry. You love poetry? Yes. Good. When I ask my students if they love poetry, there's absolute deafening silence in the entire room. <laughs> no no, no 18-year-old nowadays uh, can be found will not be found dead loving poetry. But the Vikings did love poetry. Some of their poetry is preserved in medieval books, in medieval codices, like this one. It doesn't look like poetry because the, in the Middle Ages one didn't write it line by line, one just wrote it as if it were prose, but it is poetry, I assure you. This is very valuable. We mostly hear of the Vikings from the pens of their victims. The European monks and priests who wrote the history books of the Viking Age and who often were the people or knew the people who had been robbed or killed by the Vikings. But we hear the voice of the Vikings themselves in their poetry uh, when it has been preserved. So thus the poetry is an important source of Viking history and I used it a lot when I wrote the book. So uh, it's, I, I really fond of this poetry and I do love it. Now isn't that wonderful? We think of the Vikings as this ultra-violent people, but they really loved poetry. And not only that, they liked to wear silk. <laughs> this is uh, a Viking chieftain was buried in Sweden in the 10th century uh, wearing his shirt with silk cuffs, soft silk cuffs. Where had he gotten the silk from? Well, this had used to be the uh, parts of a bishop's liturgical vestments, which he simply had stolen in Europe and had retrofitted to, for his body. But he liked the silk. He loved poetry, the Vikings loved poetry, and they kept, they kept clean. It's almost one wonder, one wonder if they perhaps were not, the Vikings were perhaps not killers and robbers, simply misunderstood metrosexuals. <laughs> Did we get history all wrong? Alas, no. <laughs> I can assure you that they were, in fact, robbers and killers. Their poetry, after all, is mostly about killing people, about <laughs> violence. Here is the rare love poem written by a Viking. It's written by the Earl Ragnvald, Ragnvald Colson, who was not only the ruler of the Orkney Islands north of Scotland, but he was also a poet a Viking and a gentleman. He was somebody who traveled a lot. During his travels he got to southern France where he met Ermengarde of Narbonne. Beautiful woman, wonderful woman. Uh, at her court that's where the French troubadours created their, their poetry. And Ragnvald came there and he realized the troubadours are doing, talk, uh, writing poems about love. I'm also going to write a poem about love. So he praised her hair, more beautiful than the hair of every other blonde. He tells us she was blonde. He praises her, her looks. But then when he gets to the end of the verse, the end of the stanza, he can't help himself. He has to talk about his warrior prowess. And he does so in a rather disgusting manner. <laughs> he says that he reddened, he reddened the claws of the eagle. What does that mean? Well, what it means, and this is a recurring image in Viking poetry, so so much for metrosexuality. Uh, 
What it means is that he, Ragnarold, had killed his enemies on the battlefield, leave, leaving their dead bodies to be eaten by carrion beasts, such as eagles and wolves. And they redden their claws while they're doing that. This is Viking poetry. <laughs> what do you think? Is this suitable for love poetry? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so that's not my number five. I'm going to change. <laughs> the Vikings were violent. They certainly were. But perhaps not really in the way that we think of them, necessarily. They showed up with their swords and axes and clubs, assailing people all around Europe. For example, when they, when they attacked the French city of Nantes in 845, that's an important attack because there was a monk there who survived, who saw everything, and then wrote down what he had seen in detail. He told us that, uh, he told us how a Viking cruelly hewed down the bishop of the city while the bishop was saying mass in his cathedral at the altar, and that's what's portrayed here. He became a martyr, he's still a saint in the cathedral of Nantes. A, there is a altar uh, devoted to him, and this is the altar piece that hangs in front of it. Uh, the, back to the monk, after recounting that event and about all, how so many of his monk brothers were killed also in the cathedral, he continues with an eruption of despair at the memory. His, he wrote, who can disentangle all the pain and all the loss of that day? Who can hold back his tears? Clearly, to the victims, the Vikings were not a lot of fun. I'm sorry, I apologize. But that's how they were. I would argue, however, that what the Vikings were doing uh, was in no way extraordinary in what was, after all, a very savage time, the early Middle Ages. <laughs> Widely accepted heroes like Charlemagne similarly killed and plundered. And Charlemagne uh, did so on a much greater scale than the Vikings. His own historian tells us, Charlemagne's own historian tells us, for example, that the emperor, with the help of his army, massacred 4,500 Germans in a single day, in a single place, in 782. This, these kinds of events are, make up the context in which we need to see the Vikings. They behaved in a way that was expected of groups of armed men at the time. Uh, but compared to, for instance, Charlemagne's professionalism, professionalism, there were amateurs at violence. The famous massacre they made was 111 people. It's not even the same scale. Still, the Vikings were bad. The contemporary records of Europe tell us a lot about that. For example, in this wonderful year-by-year -year accounts of what was happening in Western Europe that was written by Emperor Louis the Pious, his court librarian, a man by the name of Gervard, he often talks about the Vikings' misdeeds uh, and the bad things they were doing. So, for instance, in 834, they came to the important train town, Dorestad, uh, and destroyed everything. <coughs> Dorestad was on the river Rhine, in what today is Holland. There it is. So, 834, Gerwald tells us, Vikings came, Dorestad destroyed entirely, utterly destroyed. Then it's very, um, it's very strange that he writes in the next year, the 835, that the Northmen came for a second assault on Dorestad, which clearly was still going on, uh, an ongoing concern, uh, and they assaulted again, and yet again in 836. <laughs> and what happened in 837? They attacked with their usual surprise attack. <laughs> I like Gervon, but clearly he's exaggerating. <laughs> he's, getting, he's getting carried away by his story 
as one easily does when one is, write, when one is writing. If they could lay it, lay it waste in 834 and then again and again and again. But we must remember this example because this is typical for most of the things we know about Vikings. Most sources were produced from the side of the victims, so they naturally tended to exaggerate the devastation that the Vikings wrecked. At the same time, we have no sources from the side of, for instance, Charlemagne's victims. Oh, I wasn't going to show you that yet. There we go. Um, what we know about that comes from Charlemagne's own propagandists, so it's all given a positive spin. Charlemagne thus appears as a great ruler worthy of the title Father of Europe. Uh, he's still held up by the European Union as such. His victims might have disagreed, but their voice has not been preserved. You wonder what happened in the Vikings were coming every year and destroying Dorestad, 834, 5, 6, 7. What do you think happened in 838? <laughs> there was a storm and they blew away on the old round. <laughs> Sometimes you are lucky. But let's return to what Gerward said about their usual surprise attack. Uh, when he says that he's actually providing an important clue to what the Vikings were doing, a clue to the secret weapon of the Vikings. The Vikings did have a secret, or maybe not that secret, a weapon. Uh, and this is the sixth thing I think we should know about them. Their secret weapons was their ships, which allowed them to attack with surprise. That's what they like to do, and that's what Gerwald means when he says their usual surprise. So what about the Viking ships? Let's talk about them now. A Flemish monk who had seen a real huge Viking fleet several times wrote about his experience in the 1040s. He, he praised the great beauty of the ships, which dazzled the eye of the beholder. Gold shone on the prows, silver also flashed on the ships. The fleet was so magnificent, he says, that if its chieftain had wanted to conquer any people, the ships alone would have terrified the enemy before the warriors who were traveling in the ship ever had the chance to start to fight. Just the impression of the ships scares people. The Flemish monk is obviously using hyperbole, but he catched something of the marvel and also the terror that a large Viking fleet uh, must have inspired on anybody who saw it. The Vikings were also suitably proud of their ships, celebrating them not only in their poetry, uh, but also in their runic inscriptions, another kind of writing that survives from the side of the Vikings. This rune stone was raised in memory of a Swe Swedish Viking who, according to the runic text, stood manlike at the staff of his ship. Isn't that wonderful? That's like the best thing you can do, to stand like a man at the, at the staff of your ship. Yeah, they warned me about this button. This thing is much more advanced than what we have in Connecticut. I assume this is the ship that is depicted on the stone. It's hard to see on the photo. That's why I gave you an old woodcut as well. So imagine Viking ships showing up, scary. Uh, you see the profiles of those ships and the Vikings on them uh, with the ships with the dragon heads at the horizon. Many people in Europe did that. One example is the governor of Lisbon, the Arabic governor of Lisbon, whose name was Vabala ibn Hazm. And he was very alarmed when he saw this site in 844. So alarmed that he sent a fast courier to his superiors in Cordoba. Spain, which was then the capital of Muslim Arab Spain. The Vikings, he wrote, and I quote, have been seen on the coast of my province in 54 ships. 
He was terrified. The central government put all the governors of the coastal provinces on the highest alert, but it didn't help much. The Vikings landed wherever they wanted to plunder and ravish. They even took the great city of Seville uh, with storm and then proceeded, as Arab medieval chroniclers write, to kill men and drag women and children into slavery. Not a lot of fun to be a victim of the Vikings. Many Europeans had similar, similarly bitter experiences. Charlemagne's local officials also sent him an urgent message when the Vikings landed at the very northern end of uh, the northern coast of uh, Charlemagne's empire. So the emperor set out himself with his army, including his pet elephant, Abu Abbas, <laughs> to vanquish the intruder. But when he finally got there, he found out they had gone. They had already won several battles, plundered widely, and returned home with their booty. Charlemagne was furious. He, and to add insult to injury, Abu Abbas caught a cold in the damp, cold climate of northern Germany and died. We may sympathize with Charlemagne's frustration. His army was large, powerful, and usually victorious. The problem was that it was slow and lumbering. While the Vikings had arrived quickly, and without warning, done what they wanted, and then disappeared just as quickly. When the Vikings were successful, it was usually thanks to their speed, or more correctly, the speed of their ships, their secret weapon. The speed that allowed them to arrive, surprising their victims, and then disappear, quickly putting themselves beyond the reach of the strong armies of the European lands they attacked, which were all provided with strong armies, strong, powerful armies. We shouldn't forget that. They were just too slow to catch up with them. Without their ships, there would have been no Vikings. So what about the ships? Let's talk a little about the glories of the Viking ship. ship. What secrets of naval engineering had Scandinavian shipwrights discovered that made their ships so gloriously suitable for raiding and pillaging? The big revolution in, in Scandinavian shipbuilding happened, I think, at some point in the 8th century, when Scandinavians began to put sails on their large warships. This is strange that it only happened that late, because already the Romans had shown the way by sailing on the North Sea uh, during the first centuries of the Common Era. Other people living on the North Sea picked up on this uh, and put sails on their boats, but not the Scandinavians. Why not? The only reasonable explanation is that they saw no reason to adopt the sail. They must not have felt that they needed it, because they never wanted to travel further on the sea than they easily were able to do by paddling and rowing in ships like this. These are the formidable war canoes or warships that Scandinavians possessed before the Viking Age. Long and narrow vessels with spaces for many rowers or paddlers, up to 75 feet long. Two or three dozen warriors, people like that. Well, ships like that and people like that. <laughs> I mean, one of them looks like an admiral, or I think he's a commander. <laughs> Well, maybe these are not. These look pretty peaceful. But how about these people? Would you like to discuss, to encounter them out in the sea? The idea is you ram other ships, and then they sink. Big, fast speed. I'm sorry about the resolution of this image. This kind of ship functioned perfectly in the protected waterways of Scandinavia, the coasts of which are surrounded by large archipelagos, while the land itself is full of deeply penetrating and narrow bays and fjords. 
so these war canoes serve their purpose within Scandinavia. But you don't take a boat like this and row across the North Sea, right? Reli you would have to rely on your increasingly exhausting war band who were rowing. It just doesn't work. The Viking Age could therefore not start until Scandinavians had figured out to put sails on their ships, making them truly seaworthy and truly useful for crossing big expanses of water. The oldest Scandinavian sailing ship that archaeologists have found is one that they dug, dug out in the early 1900s in a grave mound in, in Oseberg, not that far from Oslo in Norway. This ship was constructed in the late 810s in southwestern Norway and it sported a mast. You can sort of see the remnants of it on this picture from the excavation, a mast made of pine, the ship is made of oak. So how about that? How do you put a sail on a ship? This is one of the examples of my, my lifelong experience of learning things. I'm not a sailor, I never was. I'm not, uh, I'm not, the only time I actually sailed, uh, the, the wind just disappeared and I was pu promptly pushed into the, into the water to pull the, the boat by swimming. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm no Viking. Uh, where was I? I'm not a shipwright either. I never reflected on how difficult it is to attach a mast to a hull. Uh, it's very challenging when the wind blows and your sail might be as large as a thousand square feet and more, you produce enormous lateral forces. The mast has to be very securely attached to the boat so it doesn't simply break off and fall, which would be a disaster for any ship. The way you do it, and I read this in a book, I didn't try it out myself. The way you do it is that you, uh, the, you attach the bottom of the mast to a heavy keelson, uh, which in the Middle Ages is typically made of a large single piece of wood. Uh, which distributes the forces produced by the mast across a big chunk of the hull. You can't attach it to one plank, it just breaks apart. You have to attach it to very many planks. And you have to have a really strong piece that attaches it. In the Oseberg ship, which is, this is a picture of, uh, eight tons, the keelson is short. It only covers uh, the very middle of the ship. It's too short. Uh, it's not sturdy enough for a big uh, ship of this size. The mast partner, the other thing that holds the mast in, in, in place a little further up, uh, on the Oseberg ship is too small and feeble. There's no way that the Oseberg ship could ever have sailed in any serious weather. Uh, out in the ocean. It would just break apart because the stuff is not strong enough. And indeed, the, the ship almost broke apart. The mast partner is, is cracking. And that's why one of its owners, uh, in, in retrospect, attached some iron belts that we can barely make out on the picture um, to keep it together. I guess that's why you use it as a burial ship. It's not very, very good in <laughs> the water, so you put it up on land instead. So the Oseberg shipwright in the 810s clearly had problems attaching the mass securely to the hull. And I think that suggests that this was technology that was still relatively new and unfamiliar in Scandinavia when the ship was built. The first Viking raid in England was some 20 years earlier, 25 maybe, uh, in 793, the first one we know of. So we know that by 793 the Scandinavians were capable of sailing across the, the North Sea. 
but perhaps they did not have such ships much earlier than that. The half-competent work of the shipwrights who built this ship in the 8th Thames suggests that this was not old familiar technology that they knew how to handle. This was new at the time. Once the Vikings had learned how to safely secure the mass to the hull, they produced outstanding ships which were perfect for their purposes. The envy of European rulers who tried to imitate the design. <coughs> what were the specific secrets of the Viking shipwrights? Many secrets, I'm sure, but I will tell you about three. The Viking ships had small drafts, that is, they had a very little depth <coughs> under water, meaning that they could be used also in shallow waters. Viking raiders could therefore get close to the beach and quickly secure their ships by pulling them up on, onto, the, onto land. And after they were done raiding, they could just as quickly push the ship back into the water again and row out backwards. That's the second secret. You can, you can travel in the Viking ship in either direction, at least for a short time. You have to move the steering plank, but otherwise it's fine. This is how the Vikings were able to show up so quickly and get away so quickly that neither Charlemagne's army nor the cavalry of the Arabs were able to keep up with them. But the third secret of the shipwright, the Viking shipwright, is more technical. It's that they built, were able to build ships with, that had very flexible hulls hulls that had great sailing characteristics because they were able to meet the dynamic forces of water by being elastic and flexible, resilient, rather than stiff and rigid. When one builds wooden ships, one usually starts with a frame around which one constructs the hull. But the Viking shipwrights did, shipwrights did it exactly the other way around. They began with the hull which they constructed with so-called uh, so uh, uh, clinker or lapstrake technique in which planks were placed side by side with a little overlap. And in the overlap you have a clinching nail, a so-called clinker, uh, driven through the overlap holding the planks together. You can see the planks of the Oseberg ship, I think, quite well on this photo from the museum. The planks were thin, but very strong, because they were not sawed with a saw. They were split radially, using axes and wedges, uh, split from an oak log. That means that the, the shape of the planks follow the natural grain of the wood and thus they become strong and flexible. Much more strong and flexible than if you had attached, if you had attacked it with a, with a saw. The hull will not keep its shape just by, by those clinchers. You, to help, help it keep its shape, they in, inserted ribs and beams into it. The result was a ship that seemed to fly swiftly over, swiftly and flexibly over the waves rather than rig rigidly meeting them, pitting them face on. <coughs> Modern reconstructions of Viking ships have usually been found to be eminently seaworthy. The, the, it's a wonderful place in Denmark, the Viking Ship Museum in Roskilde, that builds careful copies of the archaeological ships in its collections with excellent results. The largest reconstruction so far is this, which they in good Viking Age style call the Sea Stallion of Glendalough. It was built in Ireland actually. <laughs> by. Scandinavians who had settled in Ireland. You know that Dublin was founded by Scandinavians, by Vikings, for instance. 
There were no cities in Ireland before the Vikings founded Dublin. The sea stallion has sailed all the way from Roskilde to Dublin and back again in the process circumnavigating Britain and crossing the North Sea, managing elegantly also very rough seas during a 56-hour non-stop voyage in three-meter tall waves in the treacherous waters outside Land's End, the southwest corner of, of Britain. The ship did fine, the volunteer crew not. <laughs> they were severely seasick. In fact, three of them had to be picked up by helicopters and taken to, to a, a, a hospital. By the way, there, you can sign up to sail on this, this coming summer. <laughs> they they wel welcome volunteers. I hope the real Vikings were better at stomaching a rough ride on the, on the waves. This ship has sailed at 50 knots. It's expected to be able to make 20 knots. That's a great speed for a, for a very old, well, very old ship. It reconstructs, for it reconstructs a warship from around 1040. Uh, a warship that would seat 60 rowers. Even larger than this was the recently discovered ship that was exhibited at the British Museum uh, last spring, if you heard about it, and later on in Berlin, and before that in Denmark. It was even bigger. Such ships were the ships of great chieftains and kings. The Viking Museum in Roskilde has built a copy of this, of this thing. Uh, so they know how much work it takes. They calculate that it would have taken an experienced master builder seven months to build such a great vessel if he had the assistance of ten skilled carpenters plus an unlimited number of unqualified workers who could cut down and slap home the wood from the forest that was needed for it. To build these kinds of great ships were huge investments uh, that only the very wealthiest Viking chieftains could uh, afford. But the ships that they produced were impressive and glorious vessels. They were capable of bringing large bands of warriors on the Viking voyages of plunder and pillage. And they had little problems even crossing the, the dangerous open ocean of the North Atlantic, bringing settlers and colonizers and livestock, sheep and cows and goats and so forth, to Iceland and even to Greenland and Newfoundland, which were all colonized by Scandinavians uh, in the Viking Age. The Vikings also knew when to construct, instead of these glorious big warships, uh, when to construct smaller, uh, shallower vessels in which they navigated the rivers of not only Western Europe but also Eastern Europe in their seemingly constant quest for opportunities to enrich themselves, be it through trading or raiding. Whatever their purpose, Scandinavians were intensely proud of their ships. And I hope to have shown to you that they had very good reasons to be proud. Because, because without the Viking ships, there would have been no Viking raids. And there would have been no Viking Age. And I would never have come to Kansas City. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, of course. Can we have to repeat the question? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Slightly off topic, but um, I'm going to be taking my son to York 
Yes, in good. the fall, and they've discovered a Viking village there that they're yes. doing tours on. Is that worth it, or is it all hyped up? Oh, it's very much worth it. The question is, uh, she wants to take uh, 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 her son to York in northeastern England, uh, or Jorvik, as it's called yes. in Norse. Yes. Uh, there is a museum there of, of uh, uh, the Viking settlement that was York. York was the capital of a Viking kingdom of Northumbria in the, in the very late 9th and, and most of the, of the 10th century. And they have wonderful excavations there where they found a lot of wonderful things. So it's well, very well worth it. And they say it's underground? Yes, because, you know... Or cities have a tendency to fill up with... The, I mean, cars have produced pollution only for the last hundred years. Before that, there were horses. And the horse pollution sort of fills up. So that's why you have to dig down to find <laughs> medieval towns. But it's, it's definitely worth Hope that wasn't too graphic. <laughs> The question is, this gentleman thought he, he saw Mayan or, or Incan, uh, was it the colors or, or influence on some of the rune stones? So the question is, did the Scandinavians, could they have made it from Newfoundland down to where the Maya lived in, in what's now southern Mexico and Guatemala and such places, and maybe even the Incans? That's a very good questions, question. Yeah. It's almost like you have been spying on my computer or something, but, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I have, uh, in the fall semester, I taught a wonderful graduate student course together with an expert on, on medieval Chinese history and an expert on Mayan art history. We call it the world in circa 1000. And the Mayan art historian and I are working on an article which concerns some wall paintings that shows ships with clinkers. Mayan, Maya did not have ships with clinkers. Uh, there are other wall paintings that, that we, we are working on this, but I'm going to, I'm never again going to be invited anywhere to give talks when I, when I produce this theory, but there might be something to it. <laughs> Sorry. Ma'am? Uh, yes, would you comment upon the uh, skill of the Vikings in goldsmithing? I believe I saw a lot in the British Museum. Yes. You were there to see the, the big exhibition. Yes. Oh, wonderful. I envy you. I, I was never able, able to make it there. Um, the question is, uh, if I could comment on the Viking skill of goldsmithing, which was indeed uh, uh, marvelous. Uh, there are a lot, if you go to museums in Europe, uh, Sweden, Stockholm, Copenhagen, uh, British Museum in London and so forth, you can see a lot of exquisite uh, products that have been made uh, in Scandinavia by goldsmiths. Uh, some of those will have been Scandinavian. I think, I sometimes suspect that the best goldsmith would have been people that they, they captured in Europe <laughs> and that worked as slaves for the Scandinavians. But sometimes it's just amazing. You see these pictures in books and it's amazingly detailed and then you see the actual thing and it's tiny, tiny, tiny. So the detail is much richer than you think when you see it in a book. Ma'am. Present day Scandinavia and the different countries, are the Vikings considered to be more from a certain geographic area in present day Scandinavia or in what area? The question is whether the Vikings came from a specific area of Scandinavia. Uh, sort of, we don't really know where they came from. There's no reason to believe that they didn't come from everywhere. There's in fact no reason to believe that people who were not Scandinavians could have hung on and joined the troops. Uh, 
English and Scandinavian were mutually with some difficulty but intelligible uh, to each other in the 10th century still. The languages are similar enough that you, they probably if you worked on it you could understand what they were saying. Otherwise one could of course not have all these loans into English if the languages were not, not like that. <coughs> Sir? The captives that were taken in these raids, were they assimilated into society as, as uh, worthwhile people that, that produced things or were they just considered peasants, servants, low class? Well, I think it's, it's uh, the question is what happened to the people who were captured in the Viking raids, were they assimilated into Viking society or not? I think many of them were sold on. They were slaves by being captured. And there was a, a flourishing slave trade in Europe for the entire early Middle Ages, not only run by Vikings, but by many others as well. Uh, everybody had needs for slaves, and particularly the Byzantine and the Arab empires used a lot of slaves, and uh, the Scandinavians pro, uh, procured many of those slaves. It's hard to, we don't know about the details, it's hard to imagine exactly how you would get somebody from France down to uh, Constantinople. Uh, but it is, least, it is at least possible. Ma'am. I talked to someone that has a Scandinavian furniture store, and of course Scandinavian furniture we associate with a lot of teak, and I was commenting it's so odd that they are using teak because we think of teak as being from South America and Central America. And, and I asked why that was, and he said that teak is used for shipbuilding, and yeah. that very often the scraps, you know, it, it came into being because the scraps could be used for furniture. So I was wondering also, was teak used, <coughs> where did teak come in to use for ships? Because they, it, you, you spoke about pine and oak, and I was wondering, <coughs> Do you think that they no. may have I think, I, I, I don't know about teak. I think teak is, is, is something that happened. The question is whether the, they might have used teak uh, when they built the ship. One uses that nowadays. Uh, the, the, uh, I think teak is something that came to Europe after the Middle Ages. But I, I'm, that I do not know. I don't know how many questions do we want to take. I'm happy to Why stay. Three or four more? Yes, good. Okay. And I, um, I, I did something stupid to this, but... <laughs> Ma'am, there, please. I'll take you next. Okay. How about that? I think I read in a re review of your, of your oh. book. Oh. Am I out of print? Go ahead. Oh, oh I'm just going to I, I, I got some... I started to cough. Thank you. I think I read in the review of your book that the appeal of Christianity uh, began with the women, or the women had a lot to do with it because Christianity devalued uh, violence. And, uh, you know, it's kind of different from the usual story of being converted yeah. at the tip of a sword. It's, it's, it's very interesting. The question is, is uh, the Scandinavia converted to Christianity during the Viking period. And uh, uh, in a review of my book, it was pointed out that, that I didn't say that much about the role of women in that conversion. Uh, the reason why I didn't do that is that it's, this is a commonplace. If you read about conversions anywhere in, in uh, in history, it's very often portrayed that there are the women who bring the conversion on. So I think this is, this is how you tell, especially in the Middle Ages, this is how you tell stories about conversion. Doesn't mean that it didn't happen, but there is, there is no evidence for that in Scandinavia. So uh, it's certainly possible, but, but uh, I don't know anything specific about it, sorry. So ma'am. Yes, you. Oh, oh. I, I. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm wrong here. Yes, sorry. Oh, Apologies. First, I gotta say, I love your bow tie. Well, thank you. <laughs> the Vikings wore bow ties. What can I say? <laughs> and then um, I wanted to ask if the Vikings were still around today, would 
there be any hope for us? <laughs> <laughs> If the Vikings were still around today, would there be any hope for us? I actually, one of my teaching assistants got snowed in in Pittsburgh, so I, had, so I taught one of, of, I taught her section yesterday, uh, and I actually asked the students, what would they do if some Vikings showed up? And they started to talk about submachine guns and things like that. So <laughs> it's, it's a different ball game nowadays. <laughs> Sir. Uh, what, uh, are the earliest known writings of Vikings? When did writing first appear? Around around the beginning of the Common Era, there is runic inscriptions going back to the first and second centuries. Uh, these are not. I mean, this is before the Viking Age. So they are not. They are not Viking inscriptions. They are just in in inscriptions from Scandinavia. The earliest inscriptions make no sense most of the time. They're, they are so short and we don't really know what they say. One more question from this side. Ma'am, in the back. Um, so obviously there were a lot of uh, rowers and troops on the boats. Would they like earn a percentage of what they plundered or would they earn wages from people that owned the ships? So the, the question is, there were obviously a lot of rowers and warriors on the ships. How were they paid? How were they recompensed? That's a very interesting question. And, and by the book, by the way, there's a lot about that. <laughs> but it's actually one of the central points uh, of what I've been writing about Vikings is that they were not paid because they were below their dignity. They were not wage workers. Uh, rather, uh, they were not forced to do it either, because this was before there was a modern state that could force people to work, uh, to, to do. Many of you have probably been, might have been in the army because of the draft. I was in the army because of the draft in Sweden. We haven't fought anybody since 1814, so that was fine. <laughs> uh, it's a wonderful time to learn Latin, as I found, actually. Uh, but, but that didn't work either. Uh, nobody had that much authority in the Viking Age. The way you got people to fight for you was to make them like you. Uh, the way you made them like you, there were several ways you could do it. One was you gave them presents. So if you're out there conquering, plundering a monastery, it's like, wow, I mean, my, my troop has taken all this stuff. Well, here's some for you, here's some for you, and here's some for you. The poetry is all about that. Because the poetry is another way you get people to fight for you, because uh, the, your poet is your propagandist. He sees to that everybody knows that this chieftain is really generous. He's very good at fighting, he's going to take a big booty, and he's going to give us part of it. And it's so great. And we get to listen to this poetry, which is anyway pronounced uh, during the parties of the Mead Hall. That's how the book starts, with a great party of the Mead Hall, like Beowulf, for the beginning of Beowulf, for those of you who have read it. Uh, you not only get wonderful gifts, you get all this wonderful food and drink, mead and beer and all that. And you get to listen to this beautiful poetry. You might even get a piece of silk. <laughs> <laughs> That's how uh, the warriors were persuaded to become warriors. They were not obliged and they were not paid. They were persuaded. And that, I think, is the to me, that's actually the most fascinating part of this story, that it's a very different kind of society from what we are used to today. Thank you. The book is for sale from our friends at Barnes & Noble uh, in the hall.